It's nearly 80 years since the United States tested the world's first nuclear weapon. Despite that vast gap of time, the number of countries possessing the bomb remains small. Eight have officially announced successful tests, with the ninth, Israel, widely known to possess warheads, but have never admitted it. Hence, then, the interest surrounding recent comments by European politicians. Comments that for now remain in the realm of speculation, but nonetheless point toward a possible tenth nuclear power entering the world. Comments which suggest the European Union might one day attempt to acquire the bomb. Coming from political bigwigs in countries like Germany and Poland, the concept of a Eurobomb remains extremely contentious. To be clear, even if it does happen, it will be years and years from now, rather than, say, Tuesday next week. That being said, the debate surrounding Europe and nuclear weapons remains a fascinating one. One that grabs at the live wires of European and American politics and just doesn't let go. One that may soon wind up reshaping our entire world. Just before we continue with today's video, I want to say that it's brought to you by Keeps. Now, I know what you're probably thinking, Simon, you are a bald man. But that doesn't mean that I can't help look out for my fellow follically challenged friends. Keeps is all about keeping your hair where it belongs unless it's too late for someone like me. With Keeps, you can kiss those awkward doctor's office visits goodbye. Say hello to professional care from the comfort of your own home. Just hop online, complete a consultation, and boom, you're matched with a personalized treatment plan delivered discreetly to your door. And the best part, you can adjust, pause, or cancel your plan anytime. Keeps offers treatments that are clinically proven to work, whether you're preventing hair loss, stimulating growth, or just taking better care of what you've got. And check this out. The products aren't run-of-the-mill shampoos and conditioners. They're specifically formulated to complement your treatment plan and make thinning hair look thicker. Keeps is loved and trusted by over a million men just like you. With thousands of five-star reviews, you know you're in good hands. Plus, they've got your back with 24-7 support and discreet packaging, so no one has to know your secrets. So whether you're fighting hair loss or just want to keep your mane in tip-top shape, Keeps have got you covered. Thanks to Keeps for sponsoring this video, and for a special offer, go to keeps.com forward slash Simon or click the link in the description below. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Simon. That's me. Let's keep those heads nice and hairy, shall we, gents? And now back to today's video. For those who've been listening, the steady pulse of comments seems to resemble a drumbeat, one attempting to march Europeans towards a future of nuclear weapons. The German politician Manfred Weber, leader of the European Parliament's largest grouping, the EPP, recently told Politico that, quoting, Europe must build deterrence. We must be able to deter and defend ourselves. We all know that when push comes to shove, the nuclear option is the really decisive one. Polish Foreign Minister Radosław Sikorski likewise appeared to put the option on the table when he described what Europe might do if America pulled out of NATO. Allies will look for other ways to guarantee their safety. They'll start hedging. Some of them will aim for the ultimate weapon, starting off a new nuclear race. These are just two high-profile examples, but they're representative of a lively strand of debate in Europe, one that looks at America's growing isolationism and Russia's growing belligerence and wonders if the only sane option isn't to start stockpiling hydrogen bombs. After all, Europeans only need to glance east to see what can happen to a nation that chooses to live without nukes. At the moment the Soviet Union collapsed, Ukraine was home to the world's third largest stockpile of nuclear weapons, totaling some 3,000 warheads. Now, it's true that these bombs were under Moscow's operational control. It's also true that independent Ukraine was never going to be able to stand up to pressure from America, Europe, and Russia to give up its stockpile. Nonetheless, Kyiv's surrender of its nukes in the 1990s is now seen as a defining moment, one that paved the way for Russia's full-scale invasion a quarter of a century later. This is the fear that lies at the heart of the European debate, one variously referred to as Eurobomb or Euronuke. The fear that in this unstable new world, the only way to guarantee your safety is to have a superweapon in your back pocket that makes your enemy think twice. To follow Teddy Roosevelt's advice of speak softly, and carry a big stick, only to make sure that that stick is big enough to wipe out the entirety of Moscow. Of course, most of Europe is already defended by such a stick, the American nuclear arsenal. Article 5 of the NATO Treaty obliges members to treat an attack on one as an attack on all. While it doesn't explicitly say that this means America will rain nuclear hellfire down on anyone who invades NATO territory, it is certainly implied. Hence why people often talk about NATO's nuclear umbrella. It's an umbrella that extends over most of the continent. Of the European countries that directly border Russia and aren't in alliance with it, only Ukraine and Georgia are outside in the rain. 
Everyone else, from the Baltics to Finland to Poland and Norway, are in NATO. If that's the case, you might be wondering then, why all this talk about European nukes? And for that, you can thank one man, Donald Trump. While Trump's supporters would point out that he only berates NATO allies who don't pay their fair share, European politicians are worried that Trump's antipathy goes deeper than that. That it doesn't matter that a majority of NATO states are now hitting the 2% target, that a second Trump presidency would see the United States effectively abandon Europe at a time when Putin is looking to expand his empire. Estonian intelligence has estimated that Russia will attack a NATO country in the next decade. Denmark's defense ministry thinks three to five years is a more likely time frame. And while Congress recently passed a law that would stop Trump from unilaterally pulling America out of NATO, that may not be any help. Article 5 doesn't stipulate a military response if an ally is attacked. Were Putin to invade Europe, a Trump White House could claim to be fulfilling its NATO commitments, even if it only sent a sympathetic card reading, Sorry you got invaded. For the continent's politicians, that's a troubling idea, especially since it's near impossible to imagine Europe winning a serious war without America's backing. As The Economist points out, Europe's armed forces are less than the sum of their parts. The continent is years away from being able to defend itself from attack by a reconstituted Russian force. Nor might it even need a Trump victory later this year to threaten Washington's solidarity with the old continent. Even if Biden wins, everyone knows that a Chinese attack on Taiwan would take up so much American bandwidth that Europe would have to fend for itself. This is why EU politicians are now thinking the impossible, trying to imagine a world in which, for the first time since NATO's founding in 1949, Washington is not the continent's security guarantee. A world in which the only real defense is a nuclear one. The only odd thing about this discussion, as you may be aware, Europe already has nukes. Of the roughly 9,500 operational nuclear warheads in the world, the vast majority, up to 90%, are held by the United States and Russia. The rest are split across the remaining nuclear nations, China and North Korea in East Asia, Pakistan and India in South Asia, and Israel in the Middle East. But that still leaves two nuclear powers that are very much a geographic part of Europe, France and the United Kingdom. Overall, the UK is thought to have somewhere in the region of 225 warheads. France, meanwhile, has closer to 300. Nor are these the only nukes on European soil. Alongside London and Paris's arsenals, there are roughly 100 American tactical nuclear weapons held in bases in Italy, Belgium, Germany, and the Netherlands, as well as the part-European nation of Turkey. Unlike the high-yield missile-mounted warheads defending the homeland, these American nukes are B-61 gravity bombs, designed to be carried and dropped by European air forces. Importantly, though, these bombs are not under European control. Even in a situation where, say, Germany is facing an imminent existential threat, Berlin alone cannot give the command to use these weapons. The initial decision to go nuclear rests solely with Washington. The French and British arsenals, though, those are two nuclear stockpiles purely under the control of Europeans. And while Britain is no longer politically a part of the EU, plenty still see a role for London in a future European nuclear umbrella. As the Wall Street Journal writes, in recent weeks, German officials have called on France and the UK, Europe's two nuclear powers, to work with Berlin to develop a fallback plan for nuclear deterrence for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization should the US no longer be willing to fulfill that role. German Finance Minister Christian Lindner went even further, suggesting that rather than acquiring a separate Eurobomb, EU countries could instead contribute financially to the two nations' nuclear programs in exchange for protection. So this seems like the perfect time to dig a little into what exactly London and Paris can offer. Let's start with the country that I come from, Britain. Unlike most nuclear states, the UK operates a single deterrent system, what the House of Commons Library describes as Continuous at Sea Deterrent, or CASD. This means there are no bombs that can be loaded onto planes like American B-61s, nor are there land-based sites for launching intercontinental ballistic missiles. Instead, the British system consists of four Vanguard-class submarines carrying Trident II D-5 missiles topped with Mark IV-A nuclear warheads. Every single second of every single day, at least one of those submarines is out at sea, capable of launching a volley of destruction should the British state be threatened. At least, we assume that's the threshold for nuclear use. The UK government maintains a policy of ambiguity as to its nuclear red lines. In their words, we are deliberately ambiguous about precisely when, how, and on what scale we would use our weapons. Broadly, though, the threshold is understood to also include an existential threat to other NATO states. Unlike France, Britain assigns its nukes to NATO, although the ultimate decision to fire rests with the Prime Minister. This is a somewhat terrifying thought for those of us who remember the reign of Liz Truss. 
This attachment to NATO is a major reason why some European politicians think Britain could step up if America withdraws. While France will only deploy its nukes to defend French interests, British doctrine would theoretically place everywhere from Estonia to Germany under its nuclear umbrella. Unfortunately, there's a couple of catches. One is that Britain has been having some troubles with its Trident system in recent years. Tests in both 2016 and 2024 saw the missile crash into the ocean shortly after firing. According to the Ministry of Defense, these failures have not affected the UK's nuclear credibility since the US also carries out Trident tests. But this brings us to our second problem. Britain's nuclear deterrent is heavily reliant on America. The Economist points out that America designs Britain's warheads and holds the jointly owned stockpile of missiles on which to mount them. In their words, if America were to sever all cooperation, British nuclear forces would probably have a life expectancy measured in months rather than years, according to an assessment published 10 years ago. Would a re-elected President Trump really go so far as to block even technical cooperation with Britain, a NATO country that consistently spends over 2% of its GDP on defense? Well, probably not, but you can never be sure. All of which may be why some are hoping to look to Europe's other nuclear power, France. For fans of Charles de Gaulle, recent European fears of abandonment by America are Exhibit A for why his nuclear legacy was correct. Way back in 1961, the general point blank asked JFK if he would be willing to trade New York for Paris. By that, de Gaulle meant would America really be willing to lose its own citizens to protect those of France? Unlike the British, the general clearly thought the answer was a firm no. Now, de Gaulle wasn't the only soldier among America's allies to feel this way. Much closer to our own time, the former leader of South Korea's special forces memorably told the Financial Times, I have never doubted an American soldier, but I would be foolish to place my nation's security in the hands of an American politician. The difference is that South Korea, to this day, hasn't acquired its own nukes. France not only has its own nuclear weapons, but has never relied on America or NATO for any part of the technology. Here's how Britain's House of Commons Library summed it up in a briefing paper. France has sought to independently build and maintain all the necessary components of its nuclear arsenal. The aircraft and submarine platforms for the French nuclear deterrent are all designed and built by French companies. France has its own facilities for maintenance and support. The trade-off has been that France's program has always been far more expensive than Britain's. But were a future US president to suspend all nuclear cooperation, then that would start to look like a pretty good deal, not just for Paris, but potentially for Europe as a whole. Unlike the UK, France operates two levels of deterrence, one based on submarine-launched ballistic missiles and one based on air-launched missiles carried by Rafael MF3 aircraft. This gives Paris both strategic and tactical nuclear options, the latter potentially plugging a hole in European defense if America suddenly makes its B-61 gravity bombs unavailable. However, French deterrence is still weighted heavily towards submarines. Roughly 80% of France's nukes are held by the Navy, with most of them carried on board four triumphant class subs, each equipped with 16 M51 ballistic missiles. The remainder still held by the Navy come in the form of nuclear-armed ASMPA cruise missiles designed to be carried by the squadron of Rafael MF3s on board the aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle. After that, the French Air Force has an additional 40 Rafael MF3s set aside, equipped with 54 nuclear-tipped cruise missiles. Compared to the American or Russian arsenals, this is not a huge nuclear force. As we mentioned earlier, France's total warhead count comes in at slightly under 300, compared to Russia's 6,000. Still, it's enough to fulfill France's nuclear doctrine of unacceptable damage. Berlin's SWP think tank explains that this means, quote, France's nuclear weapons are directed not against a potential adversary's nuclear forces, but against its political, economic, and military nerve centers. To put that in lay speak, Paris's explicit policy in a war with Russia would be to respond to an existential threat by annihilating major Russian ports and military bases, as well as cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg. The idea is to threaten such unacceptable damage that Putin would have to be crazy to cross France's red lines. Of course, the flip side of that is Moscow has 6,000 nukes under its control. The Economist explains why that might be a problem for Paris. The French think a few hundred warheads, more than enough to wipe out Moscow and other cities, will dissuade Mr. Putin from any reckless adventure. Analysts of more macabre bent think such lopsided megatonnage and the disproportionate damage which France would suffer give Mr. Putin an advantage. In other words, Russia might lose all its ports and military bases, as well as its biggest cities, in an exchange, but France would be utterly destroyed. Still, the French nuclear arsenal is likely the best Europe can rely on right now, which may be why it features in so many plans for continent-wide deterrence. The question is, is it up for the job?
One main reason why major German politicians have hinted at a European deterrent backed by France is Emmanuel Macron's track record of offering one. In both 2020 and 2022, Macron suggested that France could redefine its nuclear doctrine to emphasize that France's vital interests have a European dimension. Both times, he likewise made noises about Europeanizing France's nuclear umbrella. To be clear, the proposal is more limited in nature than these remarks might suggest. SWP reports that Paris is willing to extend its deterrent across NATO, but not to give up or share any of the decision-making power. The choice to launch would belong to France alone. For many, that would be an acceptable trade in the event that America completely pulled out of Europe. For others, it simply replicates the same issues, only at a European level. Just as de Gaulle wondered if America would sacrifice New York for Paris, doubters are now wondering if, in the words of The Economist, Macron would risk Toulouse for Tallinn. The SWP makes the same point in a less flippant way, quoting, Because its nuclear arsenal is rather small and not very flexible, Paris uh, would have to respond to a Russian conventional attack against, say, the Baltic states by threatening the use of strategic nuclear weapons against Russian cities. And this is key, because the current setup allows NATO to go nuclear without potentially leading to global destruction. American B-61 bombs can be as powerful as the one that flattened Hiroshima, but they can also work on a much smaller yield, enough to cause damage to Russian forces and send a brutal message, but hopefully not large enough for Putin to flip the switch and send hydrogen bombs hurtling toward US cities. A purely French deterrent wouldn't have much scope for tactical strikes, at least not as things currently stand. Given enough time and potentially enough investment from partners, Paris could grow out its lower yield arsenal. Still, the lack of options for low-level escalation is just one reason why some are skeptical about a French-led European deterrent. Germany's leadership, including Chancellor Olaf Scholz and Defense Minister Boris Pistorius, have been vocal about trying to retain the American-led NATO structure, saying additional money shouldn't go into lower-yield nukes but improved air defense for European cities. But even if relying on America isn't an option in the long term, there are also worries that France won't be any more reliable. After all, the last presidential election saw 41% of voters back Marine Le Pen, a politician who has been repeatedly accused of having ties to Putin. While Le Pen denies the charges, those in Europe's East worry she could easily win the next election and immediately withdraw France's nuclear protection. As such, some figures are looking outside existing nuclear arsenals for protection against the future. And they already have a couple of nations in mind to lead the way. As the biggest, most populous, and most economically powerful nation in Europe, Germany should be the natural choice for building a continent-wide nuclear defense system. That it isn't, as you may have guessed, is rooted in Germany's history. Even as Britain and France acquired nukes in the 20th century, no sane German politician tried floating the idea. Today, though, that taboo is slowly cracking. Not by much, there's little to indicate that the German public is raring for their government to invest in hydrogen bombs. But at least some senior politicians in Berlin are questioning whether their nation shouldn't lead Europe's new nuclear charge. Among these are the leader of Angela Merkel's old CDU party, Friedrich Merz, and Katharina Barley from the same party as Chancellor Olaf Scholz. The Wall Street Journal reports that both recently floated the idea of a German-led nuclear initiative. To be clear, such an option is unbelievably controversial in Germany, and nor do many people think it's practical. Even without the historical baggage, conservative opposition lawmaker Norbert Rochgen pointed out that it would be prohibitively expensive. In his own words, building our own nuclear deterrent would take 15 years and cost untold billions of euros. That may be why, outside the corridors of power, others have suggested a cheaper version, one which would transform Germany into a nuclear power for a fraction of the cost. The idea here comes from political scientist Maximilian Tahale. If a future Trump administration pulls out of NATO, Tahale's plan is that Berlin could simply offer to buy all the warheads that the US doesn't need. That could include the B-61 gravity bombs already in Europe, but it could also include the 1,000 non-active strategic warheads the US currently has locked away. Given Trump loves to do business deals, Germany might be able to buy up to 1,100 nukes from the US for a huge sum, yes, but still for less than the cost of Berlin developing its own weapons. By Tahale's count, combining these with the French arsenal would give Europe about 1,550 warheads. He envisages them being deployed together across the continent as a true European deterrent against Russian aggression. Sadly, at this point, we have to rain on Tahale's parade a little bit. Intriguing as the idea is, the German public is likely to be somewhere between mega unimpressed and outraged with any government that tries to make it a reality. As a result, many think there's another country that could be a more natural fit for developing a Eurobomb, a proud country known as Poland. Although Warsaw has not given any indication it might seek nukes, they're clearly on the government's mind. 
Back in 2023, Poland asked to become part of NATO's nuclear sharing, indicating Warsaw would feel comfortable having B-61 bombs positioned on its territory. Ironically, the International Institute for Strategic Studies has pointed out that placing American nukes within its borders might make Poland less safe. Since the prelude to any use of NATO nukes would include dispersing the B-61 bombs to stop Russia destroying them, Moscow might be incentivized to hit any country sheltering them with a massive preemptive strike to take them off the table. That is why Britain and France both operate continuous at-sea deterrence. While the logic of escalation might incentivize Russia to attack first, the presence of nuclear-armed subs hiding at sea means the Kremlin knows it can't bomb London or Paris without inviting the destruction of Moscow in return. If it's only playing host to American nukes, though, Poland doesn't have that luxury. Which may be why some are pushing Warsaw to go beyond just NATO sharing and to invest in its own nuclear weapons. This argument was made most forcefully by Slovak-born Dalibor Rohatch in The Spectator. In Rohatch's vision, Poland could club together with the Baltic and Nordic states to finance the development of the bomb and then project a nuclear shield across the east of Europe. That would hedge both against abandonment by America but also by France. What's more, there would be no doubt in the Kremlin that if push came to shove, Warsaw would be willing to use its weapons to protect NATO's east. As to where Poland would get the technology to develop nukes, well, magazine IP Quarterly has a suggestion. South Korea. Although Seoul has never built nuclear weapons, it is what analysts term a threshold state, a country that has the tech, the resources, and the know-how to assemble a working nuke within 6 to 24 months of a government decision to do so. Importantly for this video, it's also a country that's currently forging a deep military partnership with Poland. Much of Warsaw's rearmament drive comes from deals with Seoul, and South Korea understands what it's like to live on the doorstep of an aggressive nuclear-armed state at a time when America is threatening to withdraw into isolationism. The scenario IP Quarterly sketches out is therefore one where Seoul decides to go nuclear and allows Poland to come along for the ride. The only problem would be if Russia discovers this and is thus incentivized to attack first before Warsaw can get the bomb. So, those are the most likely avenues for Europe to develop its own deterrent, either building out existing French and maybe British capabilities or relying on a regional power like Germany or Poland to do the heavy lifting. However, there's still one important question that we have to answer, one that's key to this entire video. Is any of this ever likely to happen? The reason IP Quarterly situated their discussion of Poland nukes within a hypothetical scenario about South Korea deciding to go nuclear is mostly because a Eurobomb is just so unthinkable right now, something that belongs more to a dark future timeline than Earth Prime in the year 2024. The reason for this is obvious. It's just not at all certain that the US really will execute a complete withdrawal from Europe. To get to a stage where Washington and Brussels permanently break ties, you'd first need to see Trump, or a successor with a similar style, become president again. That's obviously not impossible, but you'd then have to discover that Trump had been lying all this time and is planning to abandon NATO even if every country hits the 2% payment threshold. That's because the majority of NATO countries are on track to hit that target in 2024, including nearly every single country that borders Russia or Belarus or is close to the Ukraine war. The sole exception is Norway, and Oslo is planning to reach the 2% target by 2026. In a world where pretty much the whole of Europe is finally paying its way, will America really want to abandon its old ally? Again, not impossible, but there are a couple of points that make it less likely. One is the relative cheapness of maintaining a nuclear deterrent on European soil. Even if the US withdraws its conventional forces from the continent, it's not going to cost much to keep those B-61 gravity bombs available. Another is that the US would prefer to keep Europe on its side. Right now, the big worry looming over all geopolitics is the possible coming clash between America and China. If the unthinkable happens, then the US will want as many allies as possible. Allies like Britain and France that might be able to contribute to operations in the Pacific, yes, but also economic giants like Germany that could help shut Beijing off from vital markets. Obviously, it's a lot easier for a Europe that feels safe to back America in its struggle than it would be for a Europe terrified it's about to get invaded by Russia. Still, for all the things that would have to go seriously sideways for a Eurobond to become a reality, it's nonetheless something that haunts the dreams of many European politicians. With Moscow apparently gearing up its defense industrial base for a titanic war, many on the continent fear that now might be the time to start thinking outside the box, to break the nuclear taboo today rather than when Armageddon is staring them in the face. In a recent meeting with Olaf Scholz and Emmanuel Macron, Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk called for Europe to become not only a civilizational, economic, and scientific power, but also a military one. It may be that a key part of fulfilling that dream requires it to also 
become a nuclear one too.